Welcome to Chapter 2, Dynamical Systems and Fixed Points, Part 1. <clears throat> I'm sure you were all like super excited. You're like, man, the only reason I want to take Jeremy's Intermediate Macro class is so I can learn about dynamics. That's the coolest thing in the world. Maybe you didn't think that. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, the thing is, you unfortunately will have to learn a little bit of dynamics because this, the thing that's going to make this macro course so different from the others is the dynamics. A lot of macro courses play with it a little bit maybe, but they depend mostly on like static or time invariant models of aggregate supply and aggregate demand. We're going to be using both. You will be learning these static aggregate demand, aggregate supply models, but you will also be learning these dynamic models. And by relying a little bit more on the dynamics, we'll actually be able to show sort of like a link between the static and dynamic models. Think of the static models as like a snapshot in time, then the dynamic models as to how these things change over time. And hopefully this is going to give us a good sense as to how these models all behave. So it's really just like two different ways of looking at maybe the same thing. Well, you'll see when we, when we get a little bit further on. So here, we're just going to be learning about the math you need to understand the dynamic macroeconomic models, namely the role that steady states play in these economic models. And a steady state is like when a dynamic variable is at rest over time. Okay, so what is a dynamic variable? Well, let's start with it this way. Most macroeconomic data is time series data. So it's like one observation per period. So like US GDP, US inflation, unemployment, things like that. Those are all time series data. There's just one value, one observation per time period. Now, if you look at equation one, this is like a sequence, right? It's a sequence of y values, but this is the sequence is independent of the other terms currently, right? Each y that you see isn't going to be affecting any of the other y's. There's nothing linking one to the others. But think about something just like inflation. Current inflation is affected by what past inflation was. It's a relatively slow moving, slow moving variable. So if inflation was high this month, it's probably going to be able to stand to reason it was high last month too. It's probably going to be high next month. It's pretty slow moving. So the value that it takes now is likely going to be determining the value that it's going to take in the very near future. This is what makes something dynamic. And it's actually very useful in macroeconomics because it gives us these inter like temporal time linkages between some of these variables. It's really interesting stuff. So let's say we've got a sequence of events, but they can be related to other time periods. So instead of like what you just saw in equation one, you could just take, say, each yt and augment it by saying that yt is equal to alpha naught plus alpha one times yt minus one for all t, right? That upside down a means for all. Well, this equation now has a linking term between yt and yt minus one. So if something happened, in period t minus 1 to y, then it's going to affect y t today. This is that intertemporal link that I was talking about. Think of it as like a measure of persistence of each period's events. It doesn't always have to be one period like what you see in equation 2. It can extend to other periods as well. And there's nothing saying it's got to be one period. It could be two, right? You could have yt equals alpha naught plus alpha 1, yt minus 1 plus alpha 2, yt minus 2. Could be three periods. Could be alpha 3, yt minus 3. Now, if this was a statistical model, it would be what's known as an autoregressive process with p lags, where the lag is the number of previous values of y you have. So you'd have one lag in equation 2 because, well, just yt minus 1, two lags in equation 3, three lags in equation four, but we'll get to that when we cover time series econometrics, which is really fascinating stuff. So from just that one lag model, that yt equals alpha naught or plus alpha one times yt minus one, yt is the current value. yt minus one is the previous period's value. Alpha one is thus the relationship between yt minus one and yt. Think of it like slope intercept form, right? Alpha one is the slope it's the relationship between yt minus 1 and yt. So if alpha 1 is the slope, alpha naught is the intercept, which think of it as like the starting point. Now, for reasons that we're going to be learning a little bit later, alpha 1 has to be between negative 1 
and one. Now it's inclusive here. It actually should be um, not inclusive. Big problems, big, big, big problems if that doesn't hold. But the thing is, this isn't the only form of a dynamic model. There's other ways to model it, right? This is just like a nice, like, um, linear in parameters approach. There's other ways, though. Let's say you have $100, right? And you're curious about how much it's going to be worth in a year. Well, you have your money, and you know inflation is 2% per year. So we'll label inflation as pi. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember back when inflation was 2% a year, and that was lovely. Now it's like 3% a year, and that sucks. But at least it isn't, you know, the almost 10% that it was a year and a half ago. So things always looking on the up and up. If you want to know what next year's money is going to be worth, well, you can just simply do the following. You do 100 divided by 1 plus the inflation rate. So you get 100 divided by 1 plus 0.02, 100 divided by 1.02, which gives you 98.03. So you lose a little under $2 if you don't spend that money this year. So that $100, if you hold on to it, well, it's still $100 next year. It's just it only buys $98.03 worth of goods today, next year. Because why? It lost value. Now, what about that following year? Suppose you have, well, now X equals 98.03. And you want to know what it's going to be worth after one more period. So you're holding it for two years instead of just one. Well, what do you do? Well, you take 98.03 and divide it by 1 plus 0.02, or 1.02, and you get $96.11. So if you had $98.03 today, next year that same amount of money would be able to buy only $96.11 worth of stuff today. Now, if you've ever seen constant growth rates, you might think it's kind of like what you see in equation 6, yt plus n equals 1 plus gamma to the n times y naught where gamma is the growth rate and n is the number of periods that we're going to be interested in. Well, if we're curious about what the effects of inflation would be, this is a pretty good formula to start with, but we would need a couple of tweaks really to make it like fully appropriate in the context of inflation. First, we want to replace that yt, or like it's usually output for yt, with money balance is m, and gamma with pi, which is the inflation rate. So our equation now becomes mt plus n equals 1 plus pi to the power of n, times m naught. Now, second, inflation is wearing away your money's purchasing power, not adding to it. Equation 7 here suggests the opposite, that inflation would be adding to the purchasing power. So there's two options that we could take. The first one, which is not the one that we used above, is to make pi negative, in which case you just have mt plus n equals 1 minus pi to the power of n times m naught which says the purchasing power of today's money balances is falling with each year in the future. Now, a reasonable, legitimate way to try to compute the effects of inflation, but there's another thing you could actually use instead. This way, we actually get to flip some stuff around. So we're going to keep pi positive. We're going to start with mt plus n equals 1 plus pi to the power of n times m naught. And we're going to divide both sides by 1 plus pi to the power of n. So now... I have mt plus n over 1 plus pi to the n equals 1 plus pi to the n over 1 plus pi to the n times m naught. Anything divided by itself is equal to 1. So I just cross out that 1 plus pi to the n over 1 plus pi to the n on the right-hand side. And I nice little rule to work here. mt plus n over 1 plus pi to the n is the same as 1 plus pi to the negative n times mt plus n. So m naught is equal to 1 plus pi to the negative n times mt plus n. And that is a good way for us to model inflation. Now, typically, we have something a little different with the dynamical systems that we're looking at. Generally, you know, we have a system that's adding to the value, not taking away from it. So usually you'd have like yt equals y naught times 1 plus gamma to the power of n. Gamma is the growth rate of y, y naught is the initial condition, or like the starting point, and then n is the number of periods that we're going to be moving ahead in the future. So each period is expanding upon the previous value by an amount gamma, or a growth rate gamma. So that's kind of like for modeling like growth stuff, but we'll get a little bit more into that later. I just kind of wanted you to at least see it. Uh, now we're cutting back to the first thing that we learned, right? The yt equals, you know, the alpha yt minus 1 stuff. 
So consider the following equation. We've got xt plus 1 equals 3 plus 1 half times xt. Generally, if you see that t subscript, it's going to imply you're in discrete time. And if you see something like x of t, that's going to imply continuous time. But not everybody obeys that particular convention. Anyways, the variable x at time t plus 1 can be described by how it was behaving at time t. This is what's known as a recursive relationship. If you can relate the state at one point to the state at another point via expressing it in terms of itself, it is what's known as a recursive relationship. Now, the recursive model is also linear since the equation is a linear equation. And this is called a first-order recursive equation since it's just for one period. If it was for two periods, it would be a second-order recursive equation. So if we cut all the way back to equation three, this is a second order recursive equation. But this all tells me how it behaves. But I need a starting value, and this is what's known as an initial condition. Where am I going to start out? Where does the process start out? So let's say the initial condition is 10, right? Well, what I do is I would plug 10 in for xt. So using this equation right here, this xt is now equal to 10. I plug that in and I evaluate what xt plus 1 is, or I just call it x1 here. All right, I get 3 plus 1 half times 10. Well, what is that? That's 8. Okay, so I started at 10, and now I'm at 8. So I'm going to take that 8, and I'm going to plug it in again. I'm going to get x2, or xt plus 2, equals 3 plus 1 half times 8. Well, that gives me 7. x3 equals 3 plus 1 half times 7. Well, that gives me 6.5. Take 6.5, plug that in. x4 equals 3 plus 1 half times 6.5. That gives me 6.25. So you can see... If I plug the previous value of x into the equation of xt plus 1, and so on and so forth, it's now recursive. But here's the interesting thing. It's getting smaller, but it's getting smaller by less and less each time. Here, it drops by 1, it drops by a half, it drops by 0.25. Looks like it's approaching something, right? Maybe it's converging to something. Well, if we were to let it go on and on and on, we would see that it actually converges to the number 6. The number 6 is the equilibrium of this particular system. There is an equilibrium. If an equilibrium exists, it means the system is at rest. It's, it's happy, right? It's, just, it's chugging along just fine. Sometimes it's referred to as a fixed point. Other times, it's referred to as a steady state. So if you hear like a equilibrium in a dynamic context, right, it's a fixed point or a steady state. So for some function f that has x mapping into itself, in order for a fixed point to exist, there has to be at least one point in which f of x is equal to x, and that is called the fixed point. It's the point where the function of x equals x. The input equals the output. So the element of the function's domain that is mapped to itself by the function. If we were to, to denote x star as the fixed point to this equation, right, what I would do is f of x star equals x star. So x star equals 3 plus 1 half x star. Well, I would solve for x star, subtract 1 half x star from each side. I get 1 half x star equals 3. x star is equal to 6. In economics, it's what's known as a steady state when the fixed point is an attractor. It's called an attractor because the system tends towards that point through arithmetic recursion. And recursion is simply just the repeated application of some procedure, in this case, evaluating the function. So if I have that function, xt plus 1 equals 3 plus 1 half xt, then we could define it recursively by the following techniques. If I have xt plus 1 equals 3 plus 1 half xt, it would stand to reason xt plus 2 is equal to 3 plus 1 half xt plus 1, and xt plus 3 is equal to 3 plus 1 half xt plus 2, and so on and so forth. All I'm doing is just updating the time subscripts by 1. 
So what I could do is I could take xt plus 1 being equal to 3 plus 1 half xt, and I can plug that into xt plus 2 equals 3 plus 1 half xt plus 1. All right, because I can just take the right-hand side, oof, the right-hand side here, and then if xt plus 1 equals this, then I can take this and plug it in for xt plus 1. So xt plus 2 is now equal to 3 plus 1 half of 3 plus 1 half xt. So if I were to evaluate that a little bit, I get xt plus 2 equals 3 plus 1.5, 1 half of 3, plus 1 fourth xt. And then xt plus 2, if I evaluate the whole thing, I'm just going to make it all blue now. xt plus 2 is equal to 4.5, 3 plus 1.5 plus 1 quarter xt. And then I could take that and plug it into xt plus 3, right? Because I got the xt plus 2 on the right-hand side of the xt plus 3 equation. So I take 4.5 plus 1 quarter xt and plug that in for xt plus 2. And I would have xt plus 3 equals 3 plus 1 half times 4.5 plus 1 quarter xt. Evaluate it out some more, I get xt plus 3 equals 5.25 plus 1 eighth xt. If I were to keep evaluating this forward, I would recursively find my fixed point, which is 6. That intercept term, 5.25, is going to keep tending towards 6, and the fraction in front of that xt is going to get smaller and smaller. So it's going to make that overall value converge to 0, while that intercept term converges to 6. Thus, the impact of xt gets smaller and smaller as we go into the future. Remember, xt is like the current value that we had recorded in our system. So we can see for any value of xt, we're going to move towards that fixed point. And because of this, well, that fixed point is an attractor. But here's the caveat. Alpha 1 has to be less than 1 in absolute value. If it's greater than or equal to 1, there's no fixed point and thus no steady state. Now, this is going to wrap up the lecture for now. I wanted to keep this one kind of short because, you know, there's a lot of math, and I don't want to pester you guys with too much math right now. Um, I want to at least separate it by, you know, a start or a stop and start between videos. Um, but, you know, we learned about dynamical systems, different types of dynamical systems, and what that intertemporal link is between two or more periods. Now, if we're doing any types of forecasting, we need that intertemporal link to be able to actually forecast into the future. If there isn't, well, you're just, it's basically a best guess at every point in time. So this is going to allow us to model systems where previous values play a role in determining current and thus future values. Now we learned about fixed points and how to find them at least a little bit. Uh, we learned if the value of alpha one is less than one in absolute value, then well, the system doesn't converge to a steady state. We haven't learned how or why, but we've just learned that. In the next lecture, we will learn how and why by working through an example or two. And then we're going to learn about the graphical depictions of a dynamical system. In other words, you know, what it looks like. But until then, we're done. So thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next video.